the Europa Clipper magnetometer that I'm going to be talking about, and we'll, we'll be looking for the signature of liquid water below and above the surface. And I use the terms ice and water um, in two ways. I mean, uh, ice is something that's made mostly of H2O, but it can either be water or what I still call ice. So I hope I don't confuse you. Um, the objectives of the Europa Clipper mission are available on the NASA website, and I'm going to read them to you. NASA's Europa Clipper spacecraft will conduct a detailed survey of Jupiter's moon Europa to determine whether the icy moon could harbor conditions suitable for life. The spacecraft in orbit around Jupiter will make about 45 close passes over Europa, shifting its flight path for each flyby to soar over a different location so that it eventually scans nearly the entire moon. Uh, you notice that there's not a word about water there, uh, but it really is the search for water that links to NASA's favorite theme of habitability. Habitability does not mean that they expect to find life at Europa, but they're going to ask the conditions, uh, whether the conditions exist that make it plausible that life could or could not exist uh, on Europa. Of course, we don't know if life can develop without liquid water, but water is not a bad starting point. And sometimes it seems to me that if, the, if people ask if the spot is habitable, it's a roundabout way of asking if water is locally available. And so that brings us to the question, if water matters, then why did they choose Europa? And so I'm going to give you a little introduction to Europa. Let me get this out of your way. Um, it's the smallest of what we call the Galilean moons that were discovered by Galileo in 1610. Its radius is just a little smaller than the radius of our moon, 1560 kilometers is contrasted with 1737. It its surface shows very few craters, which implies that the surface is young. Uh, it, it, the markings are very interesting, and there's a particular region that they have named Connemara that has ice rafts. And if you can, if you were to see a blow up, you would see little uh, swatches of material uh, that um, look as if if you moved them a little bit and twisted them a little, the markings would line up, even though they are now misaligned. And that's one of the things that makes these segments seem to float. So that gave the suggestion that maybe this icy outer shell, and it is made mostly of water ice, might have uh, some melt uh, beneath the surface. But even if you um, use this as an argument uh, for suggesting that there might be melt uh, below the surface. It really doesn't tell you that the melted material is there now. It could have been there a long time ago and then frozen in, into place. So I'm going to show you a flyover uh, the surface of Europa conduct, uh, constructed from Galileo imaging. And one thing you'll see is there's shallow topography. And I always love to sit next to the window and look out of the plane. So I, I like to go flying over the surface of Europa. You can see some of these, um, these blocks of material and sort of imagine lining them up with each other. And uh, now we're going to come close to the runway. And wouldn't it be nice to land? We're not going to land but the runway is looking a little bit disturbing. So anyhow, those are uh, the it, kinds of images that Galileo provided for Europa that certainly gave 
a good reason to believe that there might be liquid water beneath the surface. Um, Europa, of course, is embedded deeply in Jupiter's magnetosphere. It, uh, it orbits at about nine Jupiter radii from Jupiter, and this schematic shows where the magnetopause is, and that's between 60 and 90 Jovian radii. So uh, Europe is deep inside, and spacecraft magnetometers have been revealing the secrets of Jupiter's moons and its magnetospheres since 1973. We had the green Pioneer 10 and 11 uh, flybys. We had the orange Voyager 1 and 2 flybys. We had the gray Ulysses flyby. Do, does my uh, cursor show? Yep. Uh, I'm yes. assuming, Mike. Good. Yes. Thank you. Okay. And then uh, finally, it was Galileo that was the first spacecraft to be placed in orbit. And you can see that there was a really very, very widespread uh, sampling of the properties of the magnetosphere, all very near the equatorial plane. So we learned a great deal from Galileo and now the Juno spacecraft is in orbit, and it's in a highly inclined orbit, so it's looking at high latitudes that Galileo was never able to explore. So we know a great deal about the environment in which Europa is present, and much of what we know from, about Europa was learned from the measurements on the Galileo mission. So its mass and its radius were known, and by tracking the velocity of the spacecraft as uh, it flies by a moon, it's possible to establish some features of the gravitational potential and thus figure out how the uh, interior might be layered. And so what one does is to assume a spherical moon with an icy outer shell a rocky mantle and a metallic interior. Galileo established two additional parameters of the gravitational potential. They're called C22 and J2, which give you some idea of asymmetries about the, uh, of this quasi-spherical body. And with those uh, parameters, we have four parameters to uh, measure five unknowns, and the five unknowns are uh, the radius and density of the core, the radius and density of uh, the. Uh, mm -hmm. Excuse me. Could, could somebody? Huh? Could somebody mute that phone? Okay. Um, so there's, it, it's not enough. It, there's not enough means to uh, to establish the full um, uh, rigorous um, uh, structure of the interior. So we have to make some assumptions, and we assume, uh, in some cases, assume an iron core and some iron. Uh, uh, and sulfur at the eutectic rocky mantle. Um, however, uh, this kind of data does not distinguish between ice as a uh, solid and ice as liquid water because the differences in density are far too small to be uh, determined. So the structure that we know is uh, plausible um, is uh, very useful, but it doesn't tell us if there's water. Uh, the first real evidence that there is a fluid layer below the surface uh, that is there today, it came from magnetometer measurements. Uh, the Galileo magnetometer made a pass by Europa in 1996. And in the plot here, what I show is the trajectory of the spacecraft by 
Europa and the perturbations about the background field. And what you can see is that they get stronger as you get closer. They get weaker as you move away again. They're tilted a little bit to the left uh, before closest approach and a little bit to the right after closest approach. That doesn't look like a uniform field. It looks like what you might expect if there were a dipolar field centered at Europa. And so this pl the plot below the one labeled E shows what you would get if uh, Europa had a dipole moment that was oriented more or less toward the upper right-hand corner. Now, um, the data, of course, don't look exactly alike, but a uh, very good, good model for recognizing that there are lots of other sources of local magnetic signatures. But this signature could have been a permanent field like the field of the Earth, or it could have been an induced field. And I want to talk about what an induced field means, and there are some equations coming. This is the only slide with equations. So Faraday uh, found out that a time-varying magnetic field, which I'm calling B of T, creates an electric field. If the variation is periodic, then I can represent it uh, with the time variation e to the minus i omega t, which simplifies the look of the equation. An electric field, of course, drives a current with a current density that I write as j times the conductivity times e. An ampere, uh, told us that if uh, the variations are sufficiently slow, a current generates a magnetic field uh, following what we call Ampere's law. So now I make a few replacements and I end up with an equation that uh, relates the new perturbation field to the conductivity of the uh, conductor and the field that is being imposed on it, and of course, the frequency with which that field varies. And uh, this part of the equation is proportional to a magnetic field over a length squared. So that means that the length is, the square of the length is inversely related to the frequency and to the conductivity. So you can learn something about the um, conductivity by looking at the properties of the induced field. Um, so that, that, that means that the response is determined by the properties of the conductor. If the time varying field is uniform and the conductor is spherically symmetric, the induced field is dipolar and currents flow on the shells on the outer part of the conductor, but they decay with distance into the conductor, like this quantity here. The lower frequencies go deeper into the body than the higher frequencies. So you can see that by comparing the response at a high frequency, which remains close to the surface, and a much lower frequency that penetrates much farther in, you can learn something about the structure of the interior. And that's the theoretical basis of what I'm going to be talking about. So Europa is embedded in a time-varying field. And this is a plot of the variation of the field experienced at Europa as Jupiter rotates once around underneath it. And uh, what you can see, the scales are the same on all of them. So what you can see is that the radial component, which is on the top uh, bar, uh, top uh, graph here, is the largest time varying field. There, the field uh, in the north-south direction, which is the um, is written B theta here, is a lot is larger, but it's steady. The time varying part that's largest is the radial part of the field. And I can show you why we get this oscillation 
uh, at Europa as Jupiter rotates, and it's because the magnetic axis, which I'm showing in green in the upper left, is tilted relative to the rotation axis. So when it's pointing to the right, the equator falls below, the magnetic equator falls below the rotational equator. Uh, get, uh, Europa is rotating, is um, orbiting in the rotational equator, and it experiences a field with a radially outward component. Now we go half a cycle around, and the magnetic axis is pointing to the left. The magnetic equator is tilted up on the right side here. Europa finds itself below the magnetic equator where the radial, whoops, where the radial field um, is, is uh, pointing in toward Jupiter. And that's what's happening here. The bars are showing us the different passes that Galileo made by Europa, and I'll come back to that. But this, the field of Jupiter at Europa, which we know quite well, is, um, is, is uniform. It doesn't change on the scale of Europa. Remember I told you it was about 15, 60 kilometers radius. This is over 70,000 kilometers radius. So the, the changes are very small over the scale of Europa. So a time-varying field imposed on electrically con conducting body causes a, an electric current to flow that I showed you in the equations. At Europa, B varies fairly predictably uh, at the 11-hour period of Jupiter's rotation as observed by Europa, and with a smaller amplitude at the period of Europa's orbit. And that's because largely because Europa's orbit is eccentric and it goes a little bit farther out and then it comes a little bit closer to Jupiter and that makes small changes in the field. Now, if I have a time varying component of the magnetic field and that, so let's think of this as the radial component in green, uniform over the sphere uh, oscillating back and forth, um, it will drive currents in a conducting layer, which I hear show near the surface in the orange um, uh, in the orange arrows. And the flowing current, in turn, generates a field that I uh, is shown in the red here. It's uniform inside the sphere and dipolar outside the sphere. You add the two together, and what happens is that this time-varying field in a perfect conductor is expelled from the interior of the body, and uh, the contours of the field become, of the total field outside, become distorted. And that small distortion is what we're looking for. And here I have a, a movie made by Shinji Jha showing us how the currents in his uh, field uh, it, it, it are changing. The currents are shown here in magenta. The induced field is shown by the, the background color. Let's see if we can do that again. So you can see the, um, uh, you, huh, no, it doesn't want to do it again. But in any case, uh, it goes back and forth. So only the um, in the interior, there's no um, uh, no uh, time varying field, just a constant field. Well, in a paper written in 1990, Karan et al. reexamined the data from Galileo's first Europa encounter, which I had shown you was uh, with a picture with arrows. And they concluded that the field was probably induced by the periodic time variations of two of the components of the external field. Y now is relative to Europa, and the Y component is radially towards and away from Jupiter. And what you can see is that if you look at the data, which are the solid line here, and the model of an induced field 
really in the radial component, you almost can't see the difference between the two traces uh, of that attribute the of uh, the the local uh, perturbation signature to an induced field. Uh, in the components that are not as uh, don't have as strong variation as uh, the um, uh, as as the Y component, you uh, there are other things that are contributing to making the perturbation near uh, Europa, and we understand those too. So the magnitude of this uh, uh, dipole uh, perturbation observed near Europa was consistent with the dipole being in an induced dipole. And that, of course, asked, uh, raised the question, what, where is the conductor? It turned out that the amplitude had to be quite so large that the conductor had to be very near the surface. But the surface is ice, and solid ice is a very bad electrical conductor. However, if part of the ice beneath the surface were melted and had some electrolytes in it like seawater, uh, it turned out that the amplitude of this field could be readily explained. However, it was also possible that the field was just fortuitously uh, in the position and of the amplitude inferred from a uh, expected for a dipole field. Um, produced uh, through induction. So it would be nice if it were a, an induced field, we'd know that the dipole had to change its orientation. A permanent field won't change its orientation, but an induced field does change its orientation. And so the desire was that as Jupiter rotated around um, uh, its axis, the field, the radial component of the field and the um, azimuthal component of the field went around a contour that looks like this. And the, the first passes we had were for one orientation of the field that was really pretty close for both of them. So you couldn't distinguish whether the dipole was permanent or time varying. And what we wanted was another pass that would be in the opposite phase of this time variation. And the, the uh, project agreed to uh, give us such a pass, but there was a long wait. And let me show you all the passes. You had to wait for three years for this to happen. So I have all of the passes here. The blue ones are too close to the equator to expect a dipole to be induced, so they weren't useful. Um, they were, there were a whole bunch of others, all in the same uh, positive radial component phase of the time varying field. Not only was that a problem, but uh, we kept losing data for one reason or another. So we lost past six, we lost past 13, we lost past 16, and uh, past 18 had no data. Uh, the rest that were potentially useful had the same phase as the past that we um, uh, had analyzed. And finally, in um, 2000, we got the, a past 26 in the opposite phase of this time varying field. And Lo and behold, the induced the dipole moment that fit the data was reversed compared to the uh, dipole moment that we had inferred from previous passes. So uh, it was very persuasive that the field is induced, and the fact that ice is not a good conductor, but seawater is conducting seem to be the only way to account for an induced field of the magnitude that was observed. Um, but the Galileo data provided the response at only one frequency, and I've told you that if you use multiple frequencies, 
uh, you can learn a lot more. And so we, of course, uh, a great many people got very interested in the idea of looking more closely at Europa and remaining near Europa long enough to look at multiple frequencies. Now, the field at Europa varies at many distinct frequencies. The, I've commented on this is the what we call the synodic period, the big period that Europa sees, uh, at which you see Europa sees Jupiter rotating. This is the orbital period that I talked about, but there are also harmonic and beat periods. So there are lots of frequencies to look at if you get good enough data. And um, uh, the amplitudes of the biggest ones uh, are the big one is has an amplitude of 250 nanotesla in the background field of about 500 nanotesla. So that's pretty easy to look for. The 85 hour period, which is very informative, has a very low, small amplitude. So you're already beginning to get the idea that we have to make very precise measurements in order to find out what the amplitude of this 85 hour signal is. So we, if we can get all of these frequencies, we can answer new questions. We can answer the question about how deep the solid crust is, what is the ocean conductivity. So let's place a spacecraft in orbit around Europa and collect measurement for months. And that way we can look for these uh, multiple periods and get very good data. Well, the planetary community, uh, those who were not permanently committed to Mars, supported the idea of a mission to Europa in the last decadal survey. And NASA began to thought, think about how to implement the suge suggestion. But it turns out that going into orbit around Europa is a challenge. Um, it's uh, a region of extremely high energetic particle radiation, and that's very damaging to spacecraft. You need to lose a lot of momentum to go into orbit at Europa, and that the mission becomes extremely co costly. So uh, the next step was to forget an orbiter and think about sending a mission that just made many, many passes by the Europa. And here I see the fin fin fingerprints of Christian Karana, who was one of the... Uh, strong advocates of the idea that you could patch together bits of data from multiple close uh, flybys and extract the periodic signals from that patchy data set. And he convinced enough people that it could be done that the idea of Europa Clipper uh, came into uh, favor. It, the idea was to place the spacecraft in an orbit that whose most distant part, its apoapsis, was in a region with very low radiation um, and not uh, difficult to deal with. And then to bring it back on once each orbit, very, very close to Europa, gather data just in the vicinity of the Europa. During periapsis, the spacecraft velocity is at its highest, so you are not gonna spend a lot of time there and then you can go back out and slowly work your way around. And that's the basis of the Europa Clipper mission. And it did get um, uh, uh, selected as a flagship mission. And in case anybody doesn't know what a flagship mission is, it means very expensive. Uh, we, we get sort of one per decade. So Europa Clipper will come close to Europa on many well-distributed flybys. And you can see uh, a, uh, an image here that shows in blue the places where, uh, I can't remember what the cutoff uh, altitude was, like 500 kilometers, something like that. And it will provide excellent co coverage for many different instruments, but in particular for the magnetometer. So here's an overview of the, uh, the spacecraft, the Europa Clipper spacecraft, and the magnetometer. 
The magnetometer has an electronics unit being built at JPL by a UCLA alumnus, David Pierce and colleagues. And um, it, it goes into what we call a vault where we, it will be uh, largely protected from the high radiation doses near Europa. And the magnetometer sensors, which are being uh, built at UCLA right now, this is a, an image of the um, magnetometer in a protective uh, shell, uh, there will be three of them at the end of an eight and a half meter boom. Uh, the boom is the same kind of boom that is used um, on uh, some of the GOES satellites. It's sort of spring-loaded, and uh, it pop. It's on uh, for launch. It's compressed into a canister right at the base of the spacecraft. And when we get uh, away from Earth far enough, the the, um, the canister will be uh, released. The the boom will be released and will spring out. Now, you might want to know, why do we have three magnetometers? Isn't one enough? Well, the answer is that we need three. We're building four. That's uh, the spare. Uh, the, uh, the, but the best three will go on the spacecraft. They're real hardware today, despite the COVID-19 restrictions. And I think we, uh, ev the whole... Uh, Europa Clipper team owes thanks to Bob Strangeway, Ryan Karen, and the whole UCLA engineering team uh, for what they've accomplished working with their colleagues at JPL, who have been really great people to work with. So um, the, the engineering model, I had to change this slide this afternoon because I had it in the past tense. It was going to say the engineering model uh, is undergoing uh, preliminary cal calibration in Germany, but actually the calibration uh, activities finished this morning. So we haven't had a whoops, we haven't had a report on that, but it's being done under the guidance of David Pierce, Hyakorth, and Ingo Richter. Um, so the Europa Clipper magnetometer will measure the amplitude of responses at multiple frequencies, and they will constrain the ocean thickness and conductivity. And here is a uh, best case sample of how this will work. Uh, we will make measurements uh, of the response, the ratio of the dipole signature to the input signature at a particular frequency. The blue lines are for the 11 and a half hour period, whatever the reciprocal is that, that makes it uh, a frequency. Um, and we will, if, uh, for example, the driving field is 250 nanotesla, we will look to see whether the response dipole is here, it's 229.5, 228, 226.5. We will look what, what the response is at the driving, uh, at the, uh, driving period of, of 11 hours. And then we will also look what the response is at the driving period of 85 hours. And we will look for their intersection. So let's assume we've got the intersection here that would tell us that the ocean thickness is 60 kilometers. It would tell us that the conductivity is one semen per meter. But you notice how quickly uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the results uh, vary uh, with small changes of the amplitude of the signal. And that's why we need very precise measurements over very long intervals of time because we have to put together data for very long intervals of time 
to extract the signals at these different frequencies. Um, we don't, don't measure the quantity that the astrobiologists would like to establish. They want, would like to know the salinity. They want to know, well, you know, with how much salt is in the water. We measure the conductivity. But there is a close coupling between conductivity and uh, salinity. This plot shows conductivity and salinity. And um, the, um, uh, the, the ex excuse me, salt concentration, yeah and the conductivity. So uh, the, by making a measurement of the conductivity, you can also infer the salinity if you know the composition. So we'll be working closely with other uh, investigations on the, the spacecraft to convert from conductivity to salinity. Uh, and there are other instruments that are measuring composition. Um, so I, I uh, mentioned the importance of high precision measurements. Of course, the difference between precision and accuracy, accuracy means that if the field is uh, perturbation is 10 nanotesla, you measure 10 nanotesla. Precision means that you measure the same value even if, if the field is 10 nanotesla and you measure 9.8, you would like to know that you measure 9.8 every time the field is 10 nanotesla. And that's what we really may, need to achieve is high precision. And that's because we are measuring the ratio of, of amplitudes, the ratio of the induced magnetic field at 11 and 84 hours to the amplitude of the imposed magnetic field. And that means that we need not know that amplitude, precise, each amplitude precisely. If they're off by a factor that remains fixed, the factor goes out in the ratio. And so that's one thing that's uh, of great importance. It means we we need to work very, very hard to make sure that we get uh, very high precision. Uh, here in this plot, I'm showing you what happens if you look at the amplitude of the uh, signal as a fraction, a percentage of the amplitude of the driving signal at a, a bunch of different frequencies. Uh, you can learn a lot of other things if the ocean thickness is great enough, you can tell how far it's, it's um, the, uh, hidden below the surface. You notice these, these uh, contours flatten out, and so you can tell something about how thick the ice is above the surface. So I, got to, I wanna get back to the idea of why do we need three magnetometers? And that's because we mentioned, I mentioned the need for high precision. One of the things that means is that if the spacecraft is generating its own magnetic field, we don't want to be measuring the magnetic field of the spacecraft. And these diagrams, I think they're spectacular. They're graphics by Corey Cochran, who's part of our team. And he's taken the uh, sources that we are told exist on the spacecraft, uh, sources of magnetic field, added them to a 10 nanotesla field that is headed southward and showing us what it looks like near the outboard sensor. And what you can see is it looks slightly different at each of the three sensors. And what we will do is make the, uh, compare the measurements of the three sensors and use that to infer the, di the equivalent dipole field of the spacecraft and then remove its effect from the measurements of the outboard sensor so that we're measuring the field of uh, Europa's environment and not the field of the spacecraft. After we've made our corrections, we want less than one nanotesla contribution from spacecraft fields at the outboard sensor. 
So that's quite a challenge. And uh, the three magnetometers are the, the key to doing this right. But the three magnetometers need to be functioning in a very sp special way that they are always measuring the same quantity uh, when the field has the same value. And uh, for that, we have to calibrate the magnetometers. And the calibration has to correct for a number of things. We, in principle, have uh, in each one of the magnetometers, we have three sensors that are supposed to be orthogonal to one another at right angles to one another. But we, with uh, uh, the best of, of effort, they're not quite aligned along three uh, orthogonal directions. Uh, so we have to figure out what we call the misalignment, the failure to align in three orthogonal directions. And that means for each uh, sensor, we have to uh, uh, specify two angles so that six angles we have to measure to correct for misalignment. We have to worry about measuring, making a measurement that is a finite value when the field is zero. We call that an offset. If you make a measurement uh, in zero field, you should measure zero field, but you don't. You get a little bit of uh, field uh, reported, and we call those the offsets. And then the ratio of the measured field to the actual field is uh, what we call the gain. And uh, there are three gains to be measured, but I Margaret, are you, you seem to be muted. I, I don't hear you and your microphone is red. Margaret, can you hear me? Mute. Uh, okay, can you hear me now? No, now I can hear you. Okay, right. I'm going to mute. You got the. It said that I had been muted by the host, and I didn't think that was very nice of you. But uh, <laughs> okay, let's see. Uh, I'm still sharing. Am I? Am I still sharing? You're still sharing. Okay, all right. So uh, I, I I said that the, we there are three gains, but um, uh, the uh, we don't need the absolute gain. So we have to measure the relative gains of two of the uh, sensors relative to the third, and that means we have eleven of the twelve parameters and. Christian has developed a procedure that determines 11 of the 12 ca uh, calibration parameters by rolling the spacecraft at a known period, which is very low, a long period, uh, at least five or six times. And uh, we, uh, he has uh, demonstrated that the uh, procedure uh, can um, uh, can establish all these quantities that we know uh, that we need uh, and um, to uh, assure that we have a precision better than uh, I've written eight tenths of a nanotesla, but it's, uh, it's um, oh, you're not seeing full screen, are you? Uh, Current slide. Okay. So um, 
he, he he's applied this technique uh, to the Cassini magnetometer during the proximal orbits and provided directional precision of the magnetic field to one one hundredth of a degree. It's uh, we won't do quite that well at Europa, but we really don't need to for the um, for the experiment we're doing. Uh, and it will provide precision of better than eight tenths of a nanotesla. And we are convinced that with, with constraining the spacecraft magnetic field, both DC and AC, and uh, giving us the spacecraft roles, will provide measurements of the induced field with precision sufficient to determine the presence of the o uh, subsurface ocean determine the ice shell thickness uh, and the ocean thickness and salinity to something like 50%. Um, let me just say that we um, have tested the calibration procedure on model data, and it's a very clever approach, again, due to Christian, starting with data from the spacecraft moving through the model field of Jupiter's magnetosphere. Uh, we do this far enough from Europa that the induced field need not be included. Um, you don't want you don't want uh, to to do your measurements in an area where you don't really expect the field to uh, be predictable. You add a realistic magnetospheric noise to the model uh, and assume that the instruments have been miscalibrated and then calculate uh, what the measured field would look like if you spin the sensors. Uh, the, the spinning has to be done at a period not found in the ba natural background variations. Now you, then you de-spin the data and if the signal uh, uh, it remains in the uh, despun data at this non-physical roll period, there has to be something wrong with the way you acquired the data. So there's either an offset error, a misalignment, mismatch sensor uh, gains, or uh, a combination of these. So you correct the data for these errors and see if the spin period signal disappears and compare it with input data. And here's an example. The black is the model, the data that we start with. It's based on the model. The uh, ordinates here are on different scales. But uh, so look at the one uh, in the third panel where you can see the model doesn't have the noise. It doesn't bounce around like that black line does, but uh, deliberately, a characteristic noise, characteristic of this part of the magnetosphere has been added to the input data. Then in red, he shows the roles, the effect of the roles, so you can see the periodic variation. The idea is to uh, assume uh, that the offsets are wrong. And in this case, the three offsets are wrong there really quite large. We're, we're interested in in precision of the order of one nanotesla. These are of the order of 10 nanotesla. He rotated, he, he uh, wrote, this is the rotation, the red, the rotation into inertial uh, coordinates. Then they play around with guessing what um, offsets would remove the, the oscillations and uh, when, when they finish guessing, they have offsets that remarkably come remarkably close to the input offsets, and they produce the field that is shown with the green dots, and it's really indistinguishable from the input field. So uh, very persuasive uh, uh, evidence that this calibration procedure is going to give us the precision we're looking for. Uh, we were confident that if we get rolls every third fly, fly by in fields that are not too small, 
uh, but well separated from closest approach that will have the calibration parameters. Um, I, I mentioned the ground calibration already. Uh, there's no place in uh, that we could find closer than the Technical University of Braunschweig in Germany, where they have a little hut with no nails sitting in a forest far from all disturbances. Inside is a set of rings to null out the Earth's field. We need to do that because our magnetometer does not uh, measure fields as large as Earth's field. Uh, we, we need to measure fields that are a small fraction of Earth's field. Uh, and so uh, in order to test the magnetometer, you have to null out the background field. And then you have to allow the uh, sensor to cool down because we are talking about taking measurements in an environment in which the characteristic uh, temperature is a couple of hundred degrees Kelvin, uh, very, very, very cold. And this is the reason we go to Braunschweig because they have a facility that allows us to change the temperatures and find out how our calibration parameters vary with temperature, because even once we get to Jupiter, the temperature will vary by tens of degrees, and we know have to know how that affects our measurements. Um, another challenge that we have to face is that uh, the there is flowing plasma uh, in the vicinity of Europa that makes its own very significant magnetic perturbations. And what we're going to do is model the interaction of the plasma with Europa. Uh, the, the, these images are taken by a simulation by Harris et al. that was published just recently. And it's based on an, an extension of an MHD model uh, produced by Shinji Jia. And uh, it allows us to figure out what sort of effects we can attribute to the plasma interaction without any uh, modification by an induced field. So this is a chart that shows you that we, in the simulation, they start by taking the measured parameters of, let's say, the upstream field, the field measured on the flyby, the upstream density, velocity, and temperature, the density, velocity, and temperature me measured on the flyby, and they also will have a great deal of information on Europa's uh, ionized upper atmosphere, the ionosphere. They will feed this into an MHD um, uh, simulation uh, and then compare what they get in the model field in the vicinity of Europa with what they know was actually observed during the flyby. And uh, the, the thing that will change from one run to the next is what they assume about Europa's internal field. So for each one of these simulations, they will assume something about the induced field. If the induced field plus the upstream give them a good representation of the measurements near, very near Europa, they will be very happy and they'll say, we understand the properties of the ocean and ice. If it doesn't agree, they will make a change on the internal field and go through this process again until they find good agreement between the uh, output of the simulation and the actual uh, quantities measured during the flyby. Um, and uh, the, they're already very actively pursuing the development of these codes. Uh, so the, this approach, we think, will do a very good job of removing uh, a lot of the signal that we're not interested in for the purpose of 
uh, inferring the induced field and then make it easier to infer the induced field. So uh, Clipper will establish the properties of the outermost shell. Um, uh, the the uh, will be able to tell something about uh, how deeply it's buried because the amplitude measured by Clipper will decrease with the depth of burial. We know how that the magnetic perturbations uh, uh, are sensitive to the conductivity, and the conductivity uh, is related to the salinity. Um, and by looking at multiple frequencies penetrating to different depths will get critical information on the thickness of the ice shell, the depth of the ocean, and the conductivity of the ocean. I think maybe I should just jump to show you a picture of uh, so, uh, the, I did talk about, uh, want to talk about water above the surface, and that is uh, that there is rather persuasive evidence that Europa has geysers or plumes, and they make a signature in the magnetic field, which uh, I, I have highlighted here, um, very predictable signatures that can be reproduced uh, by a, um, a, a, uh, an MHD simulation and provide parameters that are uh, persuasive uh, that, that there are, at least intermittently, plumes spewing above the surface of Europa. Sorry, I didn't get around to leaving enough time for that, but I want to end by saying that the magnetometer science team expects that we're going to have fantastic science. Uh, launch is scheduled for October 2024. Uh, the spacecraft cannot get to Europe to um, Jupiter on a tra direct trajectory, so it will follow a roundabout trajectory that will last for more than five years. It will make a gravity assist pass by Mars in February 2025, by Earth in December 2026. It's scheduled to arrive at Jupiter in April of 2030. And there are backup launch dates for a uh, couple of years ahead. So um, I, th this magnetometer science team is very um, full of UCLA people. Uh, you can see Chris, you can see uh, Christian, you can see Steve Joy. Uh, Mickey uh, was a student here at UCLA. Uh, Shinji was a student at UCLA. I'm not going to go through Bob Strangeway, so UCLA has a big hand in this really exciting mission. And thank you all for your attention. And thank you, Margaret. That was a great talk. Um, I think we have time for a few questions. Will you take questions? If we have happy them? to. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, please uh, put up your hand or uh, unmute yourself. No, I don't see anybody. Yeah, you know, that's the uh, problem with Zoom. Questions don't, uh, <laughs> don't always come in time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, I am not seeing any questions. I don't have any questions myself. It was an excellent. Christian has a question and he's waving his hands, so I don't. Where? Okay. In the, if Sorry. you look in the, in the, I can see him in in his video and he's waving his hands and and, but I can't hear him. <laughs> what if because I, he's muted. What if I, I can? He's mute. not. He's Sorry. muted. Let me see if I. Oh, there he is. No? Yes, uh, I was saying that most of us are muted and are not allowed to be unmuted. So maybe that's why we are not getting questions. <laughs> okay. Am I unmuted now? Yes, you are. Okay. <clears throat> uh, David Lenneman, I have a question. Yes. Um, 
how is it that the water geysers uh, create a magnetic signature? Are the water molecules getting ionized? And then you are absolutely right. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> maybe I can go back and quickly show you. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it, it is it is absolutely right. They the the uh, local uh, the plasma. Uh, in in the plume, I mean the the neutrals in the plume are uh, ionized by uh, mostly by impact with electrons with energetic electrons, and the uh, as the plasma flows toward uh, Europa, it encounters this region of uh, higher density ionization, and that. Uh, uh, it has has multiple effects, but one of them is to cause a pileup of the field, which you see in the field magnitude here, and it also produces a diversion of the flow around the obstacle, and that is what produces this field rotation that you see in the components. You see, the the field goes first positive, much more positive and then much more negative. And that's really just produced by the need to divert the flow around an, a high density plasma region. Was that, uh, did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, Paul Song now has his hand up. Uh, Paul, uh, can you give us your question? Okay, I think uh, Margaret, first of all, your you talk is really, really great. I think, uh, you know, it's so clear. And uh, I think also the technology, you know, developed at UCLA is really can make a big difference. <laughs> However, <laughs> you talk just a leave, like, a, you know, a cliffhanger movie to me. And I want to hear what is your best Gas of the depths of water. What is my best guess of the depth of the water? Did yeah. you ask? Yeah. Uh, you mean how how deeply it's buried? How deep, how, how deep from the the surface? From the surface. Well, yeah. um, you know the the ice layer is about a hundred kilometers thick. Oh, okay. Um, I. Uh, you know, this is uh, this is not a scientific answer. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I'm going to if if you're a betting person, I will bet that it's more than ten kilometers thick. Uh, oh. I'd love to hear what Christian thinks. Um, so yeah, um, the H2O layer is about 100, 250 kilometers. Uh, and there are two schools of thoughts. Uh, there are people who have suggested the ice layer may be as close as two or three kilometers. However, he already- to, what, what other, <laughs> He wants to know what, I, we want to know what you think. <laughs> yeah, so how, that, that's what I'm coming to. However, already our data show that the induction signal was not at 100%. You know, if the water level is right at the surface, very close to the surface, you'll expect a 100% signal. Uh, and we are already pretty sure it's not. And so my best guess is anywhere from 10 to 30 kilometers with 20 as the median for me. So from uh, Margaret's uh, talk, look like uh, the the conductivity or resistivity can should be height integrates. You know, if you have a salinity in the water part, and then it's actually, I, my guess is uh, uh, it's integrates over a certain length. And then when you're seeing uh, uh, water, then you suddenly increase the conductivity. I think, is that, is that a, a, a yeah. Correct, a, a yeah, that's what right. I'm thinking. Wait. Yeah, it's the height yeah. integrated conductance of the water layer that determines how much response you'll have. And then the signal falls as one over R cube because mm -hmm. it's a dipolar signal from the surface of this water layer. Right. Okay, right. uh, 
Jinsing Lee put his hand up just right after Paul Song, and then Jonathan Arnault put his hand up right after Jinsing Lee. So, uh, Jinsing? Yes, uh, my question is um, you, you tested the magnetometer in Germany, and you, when in the testing, you model the uh, temperature environment. But did you also model the um, in a chamber, is it a vacuum? And uh, did you model the plasma in uh, That's a good question. That's a good question. The um, facility in Germany doesn't allow us to do it in vacuum, but we do do tests in vacuum here in California. Um, and that's important, uh, but it's, uh, a, 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 they are, they're done, uh, they're, they're complementary tests. And also, does the plasma environment has a effect on the uh, on accuracy of the, uh, of the magnetometer? I'm not sure what you mean by the plasma environment. I was did I mean, try to show. I mean, the instrument that, have different may have different measurements in the plasma environment uh, compared I to. I don't. I, that's not a significant. Uh, huh. uh, I mean, what what you need to know is what the field of the, you're trying to measure the field of the environment and the plasma is contributing to that. And then we have to remove the effects of the plasma currents. I don't think it affects the operation of the um, magnetometer. Thanks. Mark, can I add a comment there to help? Yeah, please. Yeah, I, this, the magnetometer is not like an electric electric field measurement where you worry about the Debye length, for example. Uh, there is no shielding uh, of the plasma itself of the local magnetic field as measured. It shields the large scale field, which is why they are doing the MHD simulations of the interaction with uh, Europa and its in ionosphere with the magnetosphere. But the magnetic, magnetic field measurement itself is not affected by the presence of the plasma. Thanks. So can we go on to Jonathan? Uh, Jonathan, your turn. I'm Argy. Um, Hi. I have a question for you. So there was a paper, I believe, in 2019 by Christoph Gissinger in Nature Astronomy, where they argued that if there is a subsurface ocean, the interaction with uh, Jupiter's magnetic field will actually induce an equatorial jet that could be rather strong, they claim. And one of my questions is, with the, with the, with the precision you guys will have, is there any possibility you could look for a subsurface jet as a perturbation to your signals? And has that been considered? Uh, the, the, answering your second question first, I don't think it has been considered. I will send you that paper. Your, yeah, uh, um, we, we have not uh, discussed it in the science team and we'll take your advice and do it. But I, I uh, as far as I can see, we are really pushing the limits of what you can extract from yeah. the data without uh, additional complications. I mean, there are uh, papers that have been written about um, the effects of ocean convection and yeah. of lack of symmetry of this sort and that sort. And the, the scale, the uh, uh, signals that these undoubtedly uh, valid uh, modifications make are just at the margin of yeah. what we can detect. So there, there's no way that we, I don't think we can go much beyond what we what we hope what we say we we hope to find i'm i'm not gonna i'm gonna give krishan though the benefit of the doubt <laughs> I, and i'm gonna just send you guys this paper because uh it looks like a really coherent structure and they don't really know the scale but their upper bound is kilometers per hour and if it is might 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 be findable at some third order of analysis. 
I'm just putting it out there because it's a really nice paper. I'll send it along to you guys. Thank you. Okay. I don't see any other hands up. Uh, well, thank you all for being a good audience. I wish <laughs> I had seen you or some more of you. <laughs> and thank you, Margaret. That was just an excellent, excellent, excellent talk. Uh, and uh, really <laughs> well, thank you, Chris. That, that means a lot to me. <laughs> Bye, okay. everybody. Thanks, Margaret.